Welcome to the Comp Bio Cafe podcast. We've reimagined this to be a podcast serving up fresh perspectives in Comp Bio. We're your hosts, Melissa Minto and Janae Adams. Today, we're going to answer the question What is computational biology, also known in short as Comp Bio? We're both trained computational biologists and the field is vast, so we want to sit down and detail what computational biology is. And if you identify with how we define computational biology, we invite you to join our community and become a member or supporter through our website, blackwomencompbio.org. Members get access to content about the hidden curriculum of Comp Bio, exclusive job board postings, a Slack community of other Black women in the field, and so much more. Supporters also get access to bi-monthly newsletters and your contacts shared within our active BWCB community. Okay, let's dive in. Hi, everyone. I think we can start with how we would define comp bio ourselves. I think personally, you know, there are many definitions out there, but I personally think of it as combining computational tools with understanding biological data and I think that provides enough room for sort of what I view as a spectrum of bioinformatics and I know this might be an unpopular opinion but bioinformatics you know where you really have a solid understanding of how to analyze your data and that is a very crucial part of it I think another part of this spectrum or this galaxy is building tools to better understand data and to help with the collaboration of the life cycle of data, uh, the, all the collaboration that goes into that. So that's how I would define. Melissa, what do you think? I... I feel like I get this question a lot, especially outside of the field. Um, And so the way that, like, my go-to way for defining it is, like, answering biological questions with big data. And so if you have a question, you can collect a lot of data on it, then you're going to have to use computational biology or bioinformatics methods to answer those questions. But then I, and then they're like, okay, so what questions can you answer with that? And I break down the field into like three, three subdomains, which there's probably more, but I think about genomics, um, protein, computational protein biology, and the last one is just modeling metabolites or drugs or how that works in your body. Yeah, I think a lot of the modeling side of it often is not covered as much. And I think for me, that's where I see a lot more people from engineering backgrounds come in, like the systems biologists or like the mechanism people, even like bioengineering people. Sometimes I think that's maybe where not the continuum ends, but there is a little bit more gray area, but I for sure think that using computational biology as like a building tool is for sure like still comp bio to me. Um, I don't know if everyone agrees, but yeah. And when you say engineering, you say you, like, I know that I think of like biophysics and like thinking about modeling how yeast cells talk to each other and stuff like that. Is that what you mean? <laughs> I'm talking about um, biophysics. Like I had someone in my program and their their project was basically to model how cells talk to each other. And in their case, they were using like yeast signaling. I think of the engineering side as being like the systems level focus of biology. And um, if you're like, yeah, like modeling a process, um, using different mathematical models to understand, because there's also like mathematical oncology, like that's a whole field, you know, and to me, that's still comp bio. Uh, 
um, it is mathematical oncology, but to me, that's still like modeling how tumors progress or, you know, metastasize and, you know, applying math to biology, applying computation to biology. It's all the same to me. Um, but somehow I think the field still thinks it just means by because fun fact about this field that Ijoma apparently figured out was obviously, yeah, we know about the human genome project, but that was the er earliest funded comp bio project back in 1990. Um, and I think even um, Javon, one of our recent guests, uh, put it well, you know, in terms of having so much data that, you know, doing things by hand, experiments by hand, there's no way that one human would have been able to do that, right? So we need computers. Um, we're beyond the point of needing computers, you know. We use computers to analyze these large amounts of data. And genomic data is huge, so. Yeah, yeah. I always, yeah, I, I say, like, you're using math, stats, and, like, computational techniques to understand biology. Mm -hmm. I think, the, and I think there's a huge bias for, like, genomics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think proteomics people are not getting as much attention. I wouldn't say that. I say they, I don't know if they still view themselves as such like a new area in terms of the types of omic data that we are able to capture now. Obviously, they don't have, you know, as many computational tools out there is you know the transcriptomics and the genomics folks but like still the amount of information that we're able to get from proteomics is huge especially when you're doing multi-omic data integration and you know for someone like me in a lab where we care a lot about immunotherapy um in understanding you know how we can use the transcriptomic and the genomic information to inform what um, might be good targets at the proteomic level. You know, that's just an example where proteomics is so important. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, and I also think there's now a rise of other kind of omics data on a high throughput level, like proteomics, mass spec, mm -hmm. metabolomics. And I, I don't know because I'm not particularly in those fields, but I see the like method development ramping up in those areas and I think those mm -hmm. areas are going to start becoming more looped in by default in the computational biology space metabolomics did you mention that I feel like that's something honestly I hear that word and I want to go the opposite direction yes yeah. I just I personally can't but um, important, I yeah, especially cancer people. And one of my colleagues, his favorite data sets are metabolomics data because they are like, you know, central dogma. You have genes, then proteins, and then the proteins do stuff, and then you have metabolites. So those are like measuring the metabolites are more close to what's happening in the cell than measuring the gene expression because or measuring RNA because maybe that RNA doesn't get translated to the protein like what it, there are lots of steps that are missing or that you know there's a lot a lot of assumptions that we make when just looking at genomics data so I think metabolomics is going to get more popular as the methods um, for that gets more solidified because it is I feel a more truer representation of what's happening in the cell at that time. And I'm sure it'll have its caveats as well. I don't know. Like, do you do you do a lot of proteomics these days? So I'm getting into proteomics stuff. I haven't started yet, but just reading up on the different kinds of, um, first of all, data generation methods, looking at, like, targeted proteomics so you know this is kind of analogous to our microarrays where we had probes to um, sequence specific genes versus untargeted which is a little bit more like 
um, whole genome sequencing, except we don't, at least from my perspective, we don't yet have a standard on like, this is what this protein is. Like this signature means it's X protein. And that's where a lot of the computation comes in is matching those mass spec signatures with what we think um, its protein equivalent is. And that's what I'm starting to learn more about. And I think it's an even like more complex problem than genomics is. And there's microbiome. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you mentioned microbiome, like 16S sequencing. Yep. I've I'll, I have no experience in it, but um, there was there was a um lab at Duke when I remember first joining or first um interviewing and going into this microbiome lab, and the PI was so excited to show me his like mechanistic model of like the human gut, and I was like okay, we have a model here that's, like, um, basically the digestive system. And I know that his lab focused a lot on that 16S stuff and looking at um, proportions of bacteria and how that associated with different phenotypes and and diseases. And, yeah, that's a whole other world. The computational challenges are different there, too. All right, so let's hop into talking a little bit about our journey. Um, like, how did we discover the field? And then, like, what was our first compile project? Melissa, you can go first. I know you have a longer, a more extensive background in the comp side. Okay, sure. I don't know if it's more extensive, um, but... So my introduction to comp bio was actually before undergrad. I went to a early college high school, and so I was exposed to the college environment in high school. And one of my math professors was like, hey, you should do this undergrad research thing uh, this summer. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. Looked at the documentation, said I was going to be getting paid a stipend over the summer. And I was like, yep. Sounds good to me. Sign me up. And I got paired with a mentor. Um, This was at North Carolina Central University. And we're looking at um, microarray data and um, clinical covariates in a type 2 diabetes study. And I had like less than zero experience in the field at this point. And she just handed me the data, handed me code. And was like, I need you to run this analysis. And I was just like, um, okay. So I, I, <laughs> I spent the whole summer figuring out what even coding was, what that domain of biology looked like. Because at, at that point, I was a math girly. Like, I was going into math, and I didn't care anything about biology. But by the end of that, I was really interested in or really amazed about how we could see certain trends in um, in not only the microarray data, but the clinical data uh, with of people with type 2 diabetes. And having family members with diabetes, I was like, oh, okay, so I can, like, this is a thing. I wonder how we can do this for other diseases and other conditions. And that was my first comp bio project and, like, my introduction into the field. So when I got to college, I was, or when I got into college and I was supposed to select my major, I was supposed to choose still bioengineering, but at the last minute I chose biology because I was like, I need to take a step back and see if there are other things. Basically, I floated around um, for two years. I was also an athlete and that kind of sucked. So when I started doing research- You were an athlete? What sport did you play? Wait, we didn't know this? No. I was was on the track team. I ran track. Wow. Okay. I'm sorry. You're just learning this. Yeah, I'm so, like, um, just not athletic at all. Like, I would, 
I went for a run one time and literally passed out on the <laughs> sidewalk. Yeah. So. I understand. This. <laughs> yeah, not for me. But I love that for you. Yeah, I mean, I did love that for me when I started. But um, I think we should also have a later conversation about, you know, when your life starts to look very different than what you thought it would look like. To me, starting college was sort of like a clean slate and where I really was like seeing what I was doing in class and going to a lab, you know, going to your lab course was like a really nice experience mm -hmm. for me. Um, even if it was just, you know, like, I don't know what we were doing, little stuff, dissecting cockroaches, but like, or like mice and stuff like that. I think really getting into comp bio was like, I don't want to be a doctor. I don't want to be an engineer, but I know that there's a technical side of biology out there somewhere. And because I was genuinely curious about what that could look like. It ended up being sort of, you know, take more math classes, take the do a computer science minor and go from there. That. Yeah. For I, I literally my journey, I feel like I just happened to fall into it and then happened to just like spark questions and interests in the field. And like I remember again in college when I was taking like a biostats course and I remember thinking like, oh the data is out there why are we not asking these questions now knowing that it's a lot more complex to control for everything but I think I don't know I think that I would have also fallen back into the field somehow but maybe from a more stats perspective if I didn't have for sure. my, um high school experience yeah I also think that I would have like come from the more computational side as opposed to bio. Now, your question, do you think the early exposure? Like, yes, I was in an environment that had the resources to even send people off to do that. But there are so many other elements of my environment, both in high school and college, where there are important people that could have pushed me and challenged me more, but the system I was in didn't necessarily allow for that or encourage that in students like me. So. Um, would I be maybe in a different place? Yes, I think that's why having the right people in your corner is important. But I have reflections. Yeah, and how do you go ahead? How did you go about finding those people in your corner, those comp bio mentors? Yeah, so I think for me it was so my long term experience after I did a biochem research, I was like a biotech research assistant. I went into an ecology lab and when I was doing more of like the environmental stuff, it was a lot of it was data entry, but I told him like, I specifically want to, you know, get some more experience in analysis. And he was like, Oh, have you heard of this program called R? And I was like, never heard of it. And, you know, he really pushed me in terms of getting the experience with R understanding, like how to analyze biological data from the statistical perspective um, he had a whole course just for like data analysis for biologists and he really pushed that um, his name's Dr. McEwen and um, to this day I think that has been a formative part of my experience in understanding just how important the you know the data science aspect of, of stats and comp bio is um, how about you I think I my mentors came from the different research projects I was on, but I had two Black women mentors that I feel like really shaped my goals and like what I thought that I could achieve. So the first one was Dr. Claire Williams, and she was at um, North Carolina Central University. And she would basically, she was just really real. She was just like, this is what you need to learn how to do this is what this field is like and just gave me pointers of like you're gonna face this but this is how you respond to this and that was really helpful and then the second one was uh Dr. Chantel Nicholas and she was more my mentor in an industry type space and she helped me to 
understand more how like industry works, like working to push forward a specific business goal and managing personalities and things like that. But both of those women were so like straight up and candid with me about you know there was there was no sugarcoating when talking to them they were just like this is how it is some people are going to be rude they're rude to everybody or you know you need to show the data this way and those having those two perspectives and they're they're both different perspectives but having those two perspectives really helped me to I guess learn more the politics around being in science and helping me to set like realistic expectations and knowing like what to do to like get ahead. And so other than that, I've had a lot of other mentors from like my research projects that's taught me little things here and there. I was also on an ecology project on looking at crayfish and it was also mostly data entry. Um but that was also really fun. Yeah. I loved having that non genetics experience, but I, I only transitioned to another lab um, because I wanted to get back to human data. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. You had Black women around you at that stage, though. I didn't, I can't remember. A black woman scientist mentor. If you're out there and I'm forgetting you, I'm so sorry, but. Yeah, I think that was the great thing about being on the HBCU campus. Like that's the campus that my high school was on. Um, And so that was like, that space was my introduction to research. Um, And that that was really nice because on that campus, you really felt like people were looking out for you and they were kind of giving me the you know that hidden curriculum of like you do this not that you know things like that and then I went to Meredith College which is an all-girls school but it is primarily (laughs) white and because it was small you still kind of had that like okay kind of close relationship but not as much as a you know I'm looking out for you I got your back then grad school, which just completely different experience in terms of community. And I guess the further I went away from my first research experience, I was just like, oh, mm. yeah. <laughs> is this, is this how it's going to be? It? But I, yeah. yeah, is this, is this what it's supposed to be? But I I continually, I keep in touch with those two mentors specifically throughout the whole process. And they'll be like, yeah, girl, I told you, you got to do like this. And so those those two mentors are really important in just like not feeling really overwhelmed in the field. And and this group also is really helpful. The network is really helpful. Yes. no, not like I that. <laughs> all right i see i see that black woman there i see that black woman there they just made full professor like we we are in this field and we're in this field for a long time we can do this yeah. right so what training or experience is great to get to engage in research activities in this field as undergrad Um, yeah, I think we can start with undergrad. I think that's when most people are going to hop in to research. Yeah, I think, um, any summer undergraduate research program, like, I don't even feel like your introduction to research, um, for comp bio has to be computational. I think just getting some kind of lab experience is helpful. And for me, I was undocumented in undergrad, and so getting i wasn't I was not eligible for any of the like summer undergraduate research programs, so I ended up having to like just email professors nearby like, "Hey, I see that you work in this. I'm really interested in getting these skills um and kind of figuring out um 
yeah to get figuring out how to make that connection work um i ended up doing undergraduate research at nc state at the museum of um, natural sciences in north carolina that's where i did my ecology stuff and at central north carolina central university um and those were yeah really it was a really very mixed bag but it was really important in me showing that like i've done research and um kind of have that track record to even get into grad school mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so important i think yeah i agree that your first one doesn't have to be cotton bio specifically um i think if you are on the bio side or even yeah if you're on the bio side and you are surrounded by people who work in labs like I mentioned before, I think understanding the entire life cycle of your data is really important, um, even if you can't do every single step. So like at this stage, I can't, you know, like purify my RNA and like I'm not, you know, pipetting things, but I understand a little bit of what where my data is coming from. And, you know, when it, when the baton is passed to me, I know what to do, what to do with that. Um, I think as an undergrad, that's like the least you can do, especially you know, there's so many resources out there of even just understanding um, RNA sequencing and uh, even DNA sequencing or proteomics or whatever, whatever lab you're in. Ask yourself, what sort of data are they working with? What um, are the tools that they need to analyze that data? Could be even if they still use Excel, child, get into there and understand like how you can help visualize the data and things like that. Maybe you are the person that once you get comfortable with R, you're like, hey, let's put Microsoft down. Let's pick up R if we are going to be dealing with a lot of data. This is not an Excel slander podcast, but you know, I'm also about like building capacity where capacity can be built and efficiency. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's one thing. If you're on the computer science side, like my school was heavy engineers and computer science. Um, take that take that bio course seriously, you know? Um, understand what that central dogma is. Um, don't just, you know, I know it's not in your wheelhouse, but starting now and understanding things happening across the aisle per se is really important. Um, you know, some people do say coming in from that side is easier, but... Um, if you want to be well-rounded, I think um, doing what you can to dedicate time to both sides is important. Um, how did we pick a lab? What qualities should people find in a lab? So let's move on quickly to the responses. Um, so. Um, we sent out a survey to our BWCB community asking the question, what computational biology looks like to you? Uh, we've collected a few responses and found some interesting perspectives. I'm going to hit this from what one of my favorite podcasts calls the Twitter streets. Um, we also have Ijama here, and um, she will help to read some from our responses. Ijama, we'll do a formal introduction later. Um, Gemma's helping out with a lot here behind the scenes and a little in front of the mic. So welcome, Gemma. Yeah, mine is <laughs> mine is coming from someone that is not affiliated with BWCV, but coming from Ghana. And they said, computational biology to me is an efficient and cost-effective approach to disease detection and treatment coming from Africa where poor economic performance weakens our healthcare systems, computational biology is a crucial field for the health capacity building. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I thought that was was powerful. I feel like we have a lot of um, members within the continent and a a huge theme of comp bio within the continent is surrounding capacity building. Mm-hmm. And just training, you know, the next set of people. Um, we also have um, podcast episode with Shubin Kutumo. 
y'all can check that out. It was a great interview um, talking all about this and um, what he's doing for the Nigerian bioinformatics scene. Um, all right, so in the Twitter bin, we had just two quick responses. The first comes from Liz, who is from Oklahoma City. Um, Liz says, as a basic scientist, it means using public data from human studies to verify preclinical findings, cancer slash obesity work. It also means integrating math and biology to analyze and visualize our large exploratory data sets to see trends and new directions for future studies. I think that's a really comprehensive answer that includes a lot of also just what we were talking about before, like how people are actually using our skills. They're using it to visualize, have a better understanding of large amounts of data, and also, you know, either for hypothesis generating or, you know, that's what that, you know, new direction is. So um, understanding how your data can tell a story, I think is also how I view by or at least the data science side of what I do. And then the last response comes from Joy Auden, who is from Germany. Joy says, for me, it means analysis, analyzing large data sets with unknown outcomes that are generated in the lab. Large data sets in terms of RNA sequencing, single nucleotide or single cell RNA sequencing in spatial transcriptomics, um, in quotes, Visium platform. Yeah, the spatial world is also rapidly growing. Um, we didn't even talk, we didn't even tap into like imaging in general, but that is a whole other beast that is definitely picking up momentum. So if you're someone who, you know, is used to at least working with like single cell, or even if you're someone who are, is coming from like immunology side, you understand um, like even like understanding like histopathology stuff. Um, Imaging might be a fun world for you, especially in the computational development, like the statistical side of being able to model what's happening. Um, yeah. So thank you all for your for your responses and for your contributions. Um, it's so good to see these responses coming in from literally all over the world. Um, and I think people have really great perspectives to um, contribute there. So thank you. Let's wrap up. I, I was thinking that we could do some shout out. This could be either from members, from our like member highlights of the months, or even if someone has, either of you have seen something online that you want to shout someone out for. I'm going to shout out Laura, who just finished, not just, but recently finished with um, her master's in bioinformatics from Kwanning University in Nairobi. Yeah, so Yasita Andari, she just finished with her master's in bioinformatics from Kwanning University. Congrats. More air horns. Anyone else? <laughs> beep, 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 beep. <laughs> We can't have you doing that every time. That could be my contribution to this. I'll be fine with that. Did you have a shout out, Melissa? Um, the one that comes to the, my head is uh, Stacy Finley, mm. making it to full professor, first black woman at her institution to do so. Iconic. And what, like number four in the nation? Oh, Something I didn't like even that. know that. Look, mm -hmm. iconic. Yeah. Stacy used to be on our board, on our advisory board when we were a much smaller organization. Organization, but she's currently professor at USC in bioengineering and computational biology. Uh, just a huge accomplishment that I think is underestimated <laughs> what it takes to even get there. Thank you, actually, Stacy, for your early contributions, and thank you for what you're continuing to do, blazing the trail in the field, inspiring others, and also, you know, leading a group. Hopefully, we can get her on soon. All right, y'all. Well, we're at the end of this episode. Um, any final thoughts, Melissa? 
No, I'm just excited to kick off our new reimagined Comp Bio Cafe. Um, I think that we're going to be tackling lots of common questions or topics in the field. So, yeah, thank, thank you so much to the audience for listening. And definitely let us know what topics you'd like to hear us discuss. We'll see y'all in the next episode. Again, I'm Janae. And I'm Melissa. See you later. The Kanbayo Cafe podcast is brought to you by Ijama Miramiku, Melissa Minto, and Janae Adams. Learn more about us at blackwomencompbio.org and also tap into ways that you can become a member or a supporter today. Thank you for listening.